Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Truth of Transformation podcast. Now, I was thinking for today's episode, we talk holistic health and really get into some nutrition, gut health, overcoming anxiety surrounding nutrition and how all that plays a role. Uh, so I brought on Jennifer Easterloo, and she's a professionally trained chef. She's an author of, I think, 22 books now she mentioned, and uh, known for being an emotional healer. Like We're talking meditation for helping you build a... Uh, nutrition practice. So it's a really cool and different podcast. And I know you're going to be able to take away a lot. So without further ado, let's get into this one. All right. Awesome. Jennifer, welcome to the show. So thrilled to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, I know you got a lot of stuff in the works, uh, a ton of books, uh, a fun one coming up. But before we get into any of that, and before we even dive into some of the fun stuff like your journey that people are definitely going to want to hear about, um, I, I want to know more about like the spiritual practice activities that you use in the kitchen. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. So a lot of my spiritual practice actually comes from alchemy. So it's a little known spiritual science. I know everybody's heard of Harry, po- uh, Harry Potter, and that's completely based on alchemy. But alchemy actually comes from ancient Egypt and the brilliant people that were combining their creative imagination with science who built the pyramids were using alchemy and it comes from the old Egyptian mystery schools. But then it had like this awesome resurgence in the 1600s. So when you see all these like funky alchemy pictures that are like dragons and suns and beakers, you know, that's the resurgence or the next golden age of alchemy. And uh, when I first started studying alchemy, I came upon an image that just captivated me. And I was like, what's this all about? And I'd been a yoga practitioner forever. I'm certified in Ashtanga style yoga. I've been meditating for over 15 years. And I kind of plateaued in my yoga practice. So when I started reading about alchemy, they actually have instructions on how to deal with the chakras or energy centers in your body. And everybody knows these, your heart, your throat, or your thyroid, your brain. And this is where all the important glands rest and where a lot of we have emotional and mindset attachments to these areas too, like love, speaking your truth, having a proper mindset. But what's interesting about alchemy is it actually has directions for how to treat these areas. And all the directions are things from the kitchen. And because my background was as a professional chef working in New York City kitchens, I was like, oh man, I totally get it. Nice. But calcination is using fire, dissolution is using water. But it's kind of interesting how these operations or directions also relate to things that are healthy for the organs. So that idea of digesting and burning up things, calcination, that's with your colon. Dissolution or getting enough water or dissolving things is your kidneys and your sex organs. So, you know, the more I studied alchemy, the more I was like, oh my gosh, this really speaks to me. And uh, so a lot of what I was doing in the kitchen, that idea of, you know, when I used to private chef for people and cook foods that were healing and also try to add love was another aspect of alchemy, this idea of combining energy inside something physical we all know cook with love so you know these ideas aren't foreign to us but this is a lot of the stuff that alchemists teach is that idea is how we can harness the non-tangible mix it up or blend it with the physical and get a greater outcome and that's one of many principles that they teach in alchemy i love it i love it and see i just was down the path of alchemy was you know turning metals into gold um <laughs> yeah well of. there was a lot of metallurgists the yeah. you know the guys who who built um you know stained glass windows in the great cathedrals they were alchemists but they were also turning their own leaden mindset mm. to a golden one by doing meditation and because alchemy was outlawed by the church a lot of this language is metaphorical, allegorical to kind of hide what they were really doing, which was deep, deep meditation, contacting the divine, meditation, prayer, and mixing it together with their mindset, their genius, understanding of mathematics, and spiritual practice. So we had right brain, left brain stuff going on, and that's what that symbol that caduceus is that Western medicine misappropriated because what that symbol says is you don't just treat the body, you treat the emotions and the mind. And that's right brain, left brain. And just because these things are invisible doesn't mean that they have any less impact on your health. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And, and cause I've always worked with clients and tried to help explain and say, so you got to get your daily dose. You've got to get dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, right? And that's going to help fight the cortisol, that chronic stress. And that, you know, meditation is one of those key ones to give us a slow drip release of serotonin, but 
90% of it, it happens in the gut. Um, and so that has so much to do with food. So, and you know, that's I'd love an to hear process. Yeah. 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 This idea of gut bugs digesting things that happens at the level of what we call separation and alchemy, the gut bugs take your food, they separate it out. But you know, without the right colonies of gut bugs in your microbiome and the microbiome is a relatively newish discovery. A lot of Western traditionally trained MDs still don't know what it is, which is unfortunate, but you know, the microbiome is when I'm talking about it in this podcast, I mean the one in your gut, but there's one all over your body and we're way more bacteria than we are flesh, which is crazy. So we're way more invisible stuff than we are. Visible. Yeah. 99.9% um, energy, right? And 0.1% yeah, matter or like yeah. this. I think that's yeah, right. Microscopic bacteria, but the bacteria that live in your gut, primarily the, primarily the large intestine, you know, you've got helpful and everybody here hears of things like lactobacillus and these bacteria that you get in yogurt and fermented food and fermentation right. is another operation in alchemy, of course. But if those gut bacteria are unbalanced, they're not producing important things like B vitamins. We don't just manufacture B vitamins. They manufacture them for us. They're producing serotonin. They're doing these things for us. So there's this real symbiosis that's happening between your gut and your brain. So if you're feeling depressed or you're off with your mindset, you need to take a look at the gut because they're so tightly intertwined. And what a lot of times happens is people have all kinds of, you know, unfortunately, food allergies. I had a misdiagnosed gluten allergy that I didn't know about for years. And, and thank goodness through functional medicine and, and running into this amazing guy, Dr. Tom O'Brien, who's at the forefront of immunology. You know, I had some issues with my face and my skin. And I was like, Dr. Tom, I feel like I'm getting old between, you know, before my time. And he's like, nah, you're probably still eating gluten. I'm like, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> and I said, you know, I got the blood test done through my regular doctor that's covered by healthcare. And he said, no, my dear, that's not the right test because that test only charts one of the proteins and gluten has hundreds of proteins. It has the two main proteins, but then also many other little ones. And if you're only testing for one protein, you could still be, have issues with the other ones. So I went, I got the proper testing and lo and behold, I had this crazy gluten allergy, which was creating immense brain fog and giving me anxiety. And here I thought the whole time I was stressed because I'm an entrepreneur and I used to be a sure. chef and I used to work for celebrities. I thought that was just like leftover stress, but it wasn't. It was my brain's reaction to the fact that I could not tolerate gluten. Now, luckily, I don't have celiacs. Celiacs is yeah. uh, an autoimmune. Right. But if you have a gluten sensitivity that goes unchecked for a long time and you blend in some cortisol and some other nasty stuff in there, you can actually contract celiacs. Or maybe you have a bad pregnancy or maybe you get hit by a car and you have, you get, you know, dosed with antibiotics, which can also wipe out the good gut bacteria. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the invisible world that we need to take care of. And I think a lot of these practices like alchemy point to that. Yeah. And I mean, 10% of the world supposedly, I mean, from a research study, I was just recent, uh, recently reading was saying that people are, you know, completely uh, allergic to gluten and 1% are celiac. Um, so, I mean, that's, it's a good size amount of population. Um, so when someone is trying to figure this out, like they're going, no, I'm, I'm, I know I'm dealing with anxiety or I know I'm dealing with stuff or my body's not reacting right. Like, well, what was the path and steps that you took or what would you recommend? Sure, sure. So, you know, what I'm talking about is more personalized medicine. And unfortunately, standard healthcare is broken. Your standard healthcare package only covers testing that is deemed very necessary. They don't do any prevention. And a lot of the tests they do are cheap because it's a money issue. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my husband and I are very, very fortunate because we work in the field of integrated and functional medicine, which is root cause resolution medicine. Some of the doctors we work with are both MDs and integrated physicians. So they are doing mindset and yoga and acupuncture and Reiki and shamanism and their MDs, gastroenterologists, OBGYNs. So to me, these are the super doctors of the new age, and we're very lucky to work with them. But when we go, you know, I coach them on mindset. My husband does tech for them. They call us out. And what ended up happening was <laughs> we were at a big conference, and, uh, you know, the organizer called us out and said, Jen, you haven't had your GI map. And I was like, what's this GI map thing? And it turned out to be really inexpensive. It was about $300, but the GI map not only told me if I had gluten sensitivity and it tests for all the markers, but it also let me know what other kind of food sensitivities. So here I had a sensitivity to corn and potato I was unaware of. And then we did, went down a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. And we also got um, our metabolism tested. That's called an organic acid test. It's a urine test. And these things are so easy. 
Sounds gross, you know, pee in a cup, poop in a cup, scoop, and mail it in. And then the practitioner calls you. You can do this, you know, via Skype or whatever, and they go through the testing. But what I also found in my organic acid test is I cannot process coconut oil. Mm. So, you know, all these tests where they say, yeah. it's bad, it's good, it's bad. No, it just depends on your genetic makeup. My husband processes it fine. I do not. So I have to stick with grass-fed butter and olive oil, and it's just because of my makeup. But the trick with gluten is not everybody has sensitivities. However, I urge people to be careful with wheat, rye, and barley, because a lot of these, when they're grown conventionally, are sprayed with something called glyphosate, which is in Roundup. Very, very toxic to your gut bugs. It basically kills all the good guys in your gut, which means you're saying, parasites, fungus, come on in, take root. And that's what can be causing a lot of depression and neurological issues. So people don't realize. So if you are going to do gluten, please, please, please do organic. And gluten is only found in wheat, rye, and barley. The other thing is uh, wheat has been genetically engineered it's not a genetically modified food but it's been raised in a way to have a hundred times more gluten compared to european strains so gluten can be very sticky since it's a protein and it can stick inside the lining of your gut and this is why it's really bad for people who have autoimmune like hashimoto's mm. because it works as a gut disruptor so this is why it's problematic but my husband has absolutely no problem with gluten he eats wheat he's fine i just make sure that if we do bring something that has wheat in the you know into the house that it's organic organic that's yeah super helpful and like how do you know how, what, what signs to look for if you think you might be yeah so um i'm a person of i've had chronic gi issues like mm. i would say up to maybe 46 now well so maybe up to my late 20s i was like in the bathroom four or five times a week super sick i went to all kinds of gi doctors no one knew what was wrong with me they kept saying it was ibs one doctor in the upper east side told me it was in my head <laughs> But I was an emotional eater. I was eating way too much. I had a sugar addiction and I was eating junk food and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But then once I started to clean up my diet, a lot of those symptoms like rushing to the bathroom after you eat, bloating, I had tons of acne, mood swings, extreme anxiety, which I thought was, you know, I didn't know what I thought it was. You know, my family, we we grew up very blue collar. It was just like, you feel stressed out, cut it out, get to work. You know, it wasn't like, we, we didn't go <laughs> to anxiety. Go. Yeah, It was like, here, I have a job for you. This will make you feel better. So right. I'm not sure what it was. I thought it was just, you know, being sensitive. I mean, that's what my parents would say to me all the time. Stop being so sensitive. But I think that I had these allergies or food intolerances very early on. But once I started to clean up my diet, things got better. But I still had issues. And one of the issues was it was hard for me to fall asleep at night. And I get so jealous of people. They'd be like, yeah, I, I lay down on the pillow and I'm asleep. And I'm like, how is that? Even if I didn't have, um, I worked out or I didn't have caffeine, you know, I'd have caffeine in the morning. But yeah, you're checking the box on everything. Yeah, it would take me about an hour and I would find my mind was racing. I always chalked it up to just being type A person who was writing all these books and being a chef. It had nothing to do with that. It was actually anxiety or the neurological um, repercussions of eating something like gluten, which has those ties. And I didn't know it until I got off of it. And I actually suspect it. So I stopped eating it for about three weeks before I got the test and my waistline trimmed down. I probably lost about a dress size in three weeks. Just Your like, body was Whoa. just like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, I mean, you can see me now, you see how radiant, I mean, I don't think this is the skin of a 46 year old. <laughs> there you go. Celebrate it. It is smooth. Yeah. I respect it. Smooth, you know, so I had all these red rashes on my neck. The other thing is like some days I would feel okay and other days I would feel completely drained, but I'd sleep the same amount. So this can all be sort of a clue. Um, you know, a lot of people are blaming this on adrenal fatigue. And let me just tell you, there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. I was going to say. adrenals <laughs> work. They work. What yeah. it is, is this overproduction of cortisol. Right. And yeah, your adrenals get annoyed, but they never stop producing cortisol. So this is why we run into trouble. So sure, it could be that you just have this low-grade constant cortisol 
But I find that things like if you have a gluten sensitivity, your cortisol is going to go up if you don't know about it. So to get something like the GI map is around $300. You have to find a practitioner who's going to go through it with you and really explain it. And going after off gluten is so easy. It's like a no brainer. There's all these beautiful cauliflower pizza crusts and gluten free pasta. I try not to load up too much on like, you know, the gluten free package stuff though. I right. do more paleo style, but when I want pizza, I don't sweat it. And on Honestly, I feel so awesome. I don't miss regular pizza. I don't even think about it. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. We do cauliflower crust just because it tastes good. So I'm with you. And there's a and I love that you said, there. yeah, exactly. And I'm like, get your servings of vegetables. Um, but I love that you said paleo style because it's not like you're adopting one format. But really, when we look at the majority of diets that are out there that are popular mainstream, I should say, you know, majority of them are, you know, decent amount of high quality lean proteins, a decent amount of vegetables, some quality fiber, beans or whatever. And then it, there's playing with either the carbs or with the fats and, and going with what fits for the individual. Um, but, but bringing it back, because you mentioned also, you know, you were addicted to sugar um, and there was some past history there with some stuff. So I kind of want to hear how you ended up shifting into this. I mean, obviously, the it sounds like you, you shifted before you ended up figuring out all the gut stuff and, and all the microbiome stuff. Yeah. So the big shift came for me in my late twenties when I was still uh, emotional eating and my family like, Oh my gosh, we were terrible. And we loved food. I mean, I'm Hungarian, Italian, grew up in Pittsburgh and um, my grand would cook these feasts. Her cooking was amazing. And we ate vegetables and protein, but we just ate too much food. And then we'd do that thing where we'd have to have dessert every single night. And then we'd unbutton our pants and have to have another piece. <laughs> which is ridiculous. I would always overeat it every single meal. And my parents did it too, but you know, they came out of the depression and that was just a sign of wealth and, and they didn't see it as anything toxic or bad. It wasn't a shameful thing. We were just like always gorging us, ourselves on food and kind of relate that back to not having a certain amount of love. So that idea that, you know, in our family, my dad's mother passed away in childbirth with him and I lost my mother at a young age. So I think food really fit that sweet spot of making us feel loved because we didn't have that, that those mother figures in our lives. Mm. Um, so getting back to the emotional eating, it wasn't until I was in my late 20s and we had moved to New York City and my husband was doing cancer research at the time. He was an R&D chemist. And, and I was like, New York, I'm so scared. I don't want to go to the big city. And we came here and it was just like an explosive experience. And I started studying yoga. And uh, the more I studied yoga, the more I was like, damn, I've got so many fears. What is all this stuff? I started to become way more aware of what was going on in my mind and my mindset. And I noticed that every time I had a fear, I would tense my stomach and I'd reach for food. Hmm. Or even times I was happy, I would be like not even hungry. And I'd be like, let's get something to eat. So I would, you know, just watch kind of these reactions in my body. And yogis talk a lot about the body-mind connection. And I noticed if I would just relax that part of my body, what would happen to the mind? And a lot of times my mind would just release the thought. And I did this practice every day for an entire year. And at the end of that year, my emotional eating addiction melted away. And it was so dramatic for me. And I think I was, you know, in my 20s, like, oh, my gosh. And, you know, end of 20s, just to not have to, first of all, have all the issues with the bathroom stuff, but also to be a healthy weight for the first time in my life. And I, you know, I lost, I want to say around 60 pounds. So it was just felt so good to feel attractive and feel fit. And I was doing yoga and I was in New York City. But I, at this point, I hadn't become a chef yet. I didn't become a chef until I was in my 30s. But I just feel so fortunate that I kind of made peace with, you know, that emotional addiction before I got into restaurants, because I tell you what, <laughs> that could have been a recipe been for trouble. disaster. But through my practice of yoga, I also conquered my fear to, you know, go to culinary school and become a chef. And I was working in New York City kitchens for three years with some badass guys. Some of them were criminals, illegal, like I was the only girl there. <laughs> I saw some wild stuff and I got some just incredible training. And then I went on to private chef for some celebrities. And then, um, you know, I started working on publishing. So it's, it's been a wild ride, but I really chalk it up to changing my mindset was the doorway in, you know, and it, it was a long path about 10 years until I, until I found functional medicine. I love it. Um, you know, most people are listening to this, seeking outside advice and you're saying, look within, which is what we talk about a lot. And it sounds like it was the process of just observing the thoughts. Thoughts and, uh, are the language of the mind, and yet feelings are the language of the body. And so it was, 
getting the mind to start controlling the body's feelings or to suppress them or to allow them no. to... Yeah, the way it works in yoga and alchemy is there's no judgment. That's the beauty. It's when you're doing these practices, you're allowed to just witness. So you, So in alchemy and yoga and a lot of other traditions, Buddhism, we have two minds. We've got the monkey mind that's attached to the ego. Who am I? What do people think of me? What should I be in my life? How much money sure. should I make? And then we've got something called the higher self or the witness isn't perfect but usually that's the one that's like our conscience or it's a little bit wiser so when we're doing meditation we hear those thoughts come in you know i'm wasting time meditating because i should be doing that video series or getting ready for that podcast and then we can just witness you just watch the thoughts but you don't judge and you don't think i'm a bad person for thinking this i'm a good person you don't even entertain or hook into those thoughts sure. when you start to witness and you don't judge not only do you kind of see patterns and you can release them, but then you also become less judgmental of others, Yeah, which is so important spiritually because when you judge other people, what, do you, what you don't understand is you never see their history or what's going on, or maybe you're judging them because of something you fear yourself. And the less you can judge people and the more you can focus on what you're meant to be doing spiritually, if you're meant to be a healer or a great athlete or, you know, running an awesome podcast to help people get healthy, that's the magic, not, oh, Betty wore this dress and she looks terrible in it. You know, nothing magical is going to come from judging. I mean, of course, you want something that's called um, discernment, you know, that idea that you're discerning and how you allow people into your lives and take on experiences. But the more you do the meditation, the more you become aware of mental programming, so to speak. And this comes from bad experiences or what you think of bad experiences, comes from what your parents teach you, comes from beliefs that you have that are not true. So you may have a belief about yourself like I'll always be fat or I'm ugly because I had weight issues or, you know, and what you understand after you do these practices, I'm beautiful because you start to see the inner you. And when that happens, the outer you transforms too. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I've uh, recently just shifted my meditation practice from a 20 minute to trying to stay in practice until I feel like I'm fully ready to get up. And sometimes that's 45 minutes and uh, fortunate enough to have that time in the morning um, after selling my last business to do this. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a trip and, and fascinating with how it really does make a difference throughout the rest of your day. Um, and the lack of need from indulging from other things as you've kind of tapped into more of that conscious center and, and fulfilled that, that love sense within, which is powerful. So. Yeah. And that love sense within is just communing with, you know, divine consciousness or the collective consciousness as Carl Jung called it, or, and you understand that all people are connected, all things. I mean, this is what shamanism teaches when they do these psychotropic journeys they they see it like all the plants talking to them they're talking to the plants like all this yeah. all every spiritual tradition teaches this and once you could just go inside to connect it is like getting love it's fantastic but it's also just an enormous break for your mind and for your body and what happens biologically is all those stress hormones come way down so it's a free way to get rid of stress that doesn't have any side effects like drinking or smoking and you know I love my wine just like the next guy but I got my epigenetics back and wine is not a good idea for me anymore now that I know what's going on with my genetics so you know once you start getting into health the old habits may need to fall away and meditation is a great way to make that happen yeah no beautiful beautiful much appreciated so segueing just a little bit um, you know, how long have you, I mean, you, you went in and became classically trained chef, so to speak, and then did, you know, private cooking and stuff like that. And then when was the shift towards, you know, teaching other people to cook healthy and how did that come about and where are you going with that now? Yeah. So it was maybe, I kind of lose track of time, but I want to say maybe five or six years into my cooking career <laughs> that I decided to do, to go to the Institute uh, for Integrative Nutrition and also do uh, a yoga certification and, and start a health coaching business because so many people were coming up to me constantly. And sometimes I'd be, you know, in New York City subway, the person next to me was there picking my brain about health. It was just like, I couldn't get away from it. And I just felt like, I don't know if it was in my aura or the way I looked or what it was, but people 
people just constantly approaching me. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to start this health coaching practice. And I had some success with it, but I focused mainly on food. But it wasn't really until I got more into integrated and functional medicine that I started to really incorporate what I learned from alchemy, which happened later, which is really incorporating mindset, emotional healing, and superfoods for the body and adaptogenic foods for the body that I really saw a major leap for people. And then I started coaching doctors, which was super weird, but I'm basically an emotional health coach for doctors because this, the mega healers that I write cookbooks for and that I do food programs for have an enormous weight to bear. They have cash-based practices. They're working around the clock. They have more than 100 clients at a time. They have their own doubt, but they're afraid to, you know, voice a lot of their fears and concerns to their coworkers because they're doctors. They have to show that they're strong. Okay. So I do a lot of mindset coaching. Most of them have the food stuff tapped down, but we, we dabble a little bit with the food just to see where they are, making sure that they're using herbalism where it could give them a helping hand, but we're going deeper into spiritual practice, meditation, and some of them, uh, you know, are more attracted to yoga some are more attracted to shamanism some are more attracted to energetic systems like reiki um acupressure acupuncture and massage but you know i'm helping them to keep their head above water and to kind of hold it together um because i've had to do so i mean it's been pretty much trial by fire since i started my culinary degree in 2003 so Beautiful. It's funny how all coaches need coaches. We all need yeah, that. Yes. You I have know, mine that. too. I exactly. have five coaches. So, you know, and they're all from different areas, just like you have your dentist, your doctor, OBGYN, acupuncture. That's right. Yeah. Beautiful. So when uh, people are seeking you out and, you know, they're picking up your books, what are they mostly reaching for? Because it doesn't sound like people are coming to you or coming for your stuff. And, you know, I mean, your website does a phenomenal job with all the blogs and all the good quality free information that you provide from videos and everything. Um, but they're not just coming to you to lose weight. They're coming to you for something else beyond that. What would you say that is when they're reaching for you? Yeah, I think I had this misconception when, you know, I, I became a chef that I thought people wanted me for my food and my food tastes great. You know, it's, it's good. I'm a good cook. Hey, but if I you think... can make 50 different <laughs> shades of kale. Um, <laughs> yeah, if I can kale, make kale taste good. good. Yeah. yeah, you're good. I think, I think what people really want is, you know, me as a person or my energy or my perspective. And that idea that, you know, when I work with people or when I'm in the person's physical presence, the thing they tell me over and over again is I feel so good after I leave you. It doesn't matter if I cook for them, we're doing Reiki, you know, we're doing emotional healing techniques. So it's really, you know, when you're a practitioner, it's really your unique take and it's you as a healer that that's what people are looking for. So if you're using science, that's fantastic, but they're coming to you because they see you as their type of person or the leader of their particular tribe. And, you know, we need a million tribe leaders. And a lot of like my doctors I coach, they're like, I'm so competitive. This lady's doing the same book as me. I'm like, listen, hold up. We need like a million of you integrated doctors. So don't, it's not competitive. She's a slightly different tribe than you. And we have plenty of space for everyone. And, um, you know, what's important to know is like, we don't really have systematized cuisine in this country we our healthcare systems really messed up people are still eating fast food people are still doing things that are like garbage things mentally emotionally with what's going on posting on facebook and politics and all this we need as many of these tribal leader healers as we can possibly get so i find when people come to me i think what they're looking for is emotional healing and whether I do that through the food or through the mindset or through um, special kinds of emotional coaching, to me, it's immaterial. I am there to serve them and I work where they need to work and I can work on any end of that triangle. We can do the food, we can do the mindset, we can do the emotions. But I think my special gift is, and I think it's because I, I'm definitely a very sympathetic, empathic person. I feel where they are, and I go right for the jugular. <laughs> <laughs> Not, how nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> In a gentle, kind of strict way, yes. Yeah, yeah. Tough In a loving way, way cause it's what they need, <laughs> right? Yeah. Sell them what they want, and then help them with what they really need, because that's what we all really want, and someone yes. to actually hold our feet to the fire. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Much appreciated. So before I ask my last question, uh, I know you got another new book coming out. It was kind of what we actually 
queued off start and talking about. So fill us in on that. And then also where people can find you on whatever channels you're on right now. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super excited about the new book. I think, uh, well, I know this book is my favorite book I've ever written. It's called Superfood Alchemy. So it's really how to dovetail and mix and blend self-care practices to make them more powerful. So it's a cookbook that has food, but it also has things like saging, mindset tools, meditations, crystals, and all the different tools I use in my practice. And my pra- and Superfood Alchemy, you can find it at superfoodalchemy.com. We've got a great free video series to get you started on all those important holistic practices. And then for my coaching practice, it's body and soul alchemy. And uh, yeah, a lot of my coaching clients, you know, they love the website, but I get a lot, I get about a 90% referral rate. So the referrals keep coming in. I feel very blessed. And uh, it's been a very rewarding uh, past 15 years in this business. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely link all that up in the show notes so people can go, especially with a free guy. That's great. All right. So my last question is, what do you believe it takes to truly transform? Yeah, I think true transformation is really all about awareness and your mindset. You know, without that, it, it just a lot of the, unfortunately, a lot of the bad habits that you have are just knee-jerk reactions because you could just be a, unaware of certain programming or certain things that are in your subconscious. So to me, the only way to get yourself unstuck is, you know, to do some exercise for your brain, which is meditation. And you don't have to follow any spiritual or religious tradition. I know a lot of atheists that do meditation of great success, but I I know personally through my mindfulness practices and meditation that that's where it's been the huge unlocking. I don't think I would have ever had the courage. I know I would have never had the courage to become a chef and work with some of the amazing superstars that I've come in contact with. And, you know, it's a mindset that really transforms your life because it, it informs how you take action. So I just, my, you know, teaching meditation and my coaching practice is paramount. And that's the one thing that is the mainstay and at the heart of a lot of what I do. And your mindset also influences emotional health. Beautiful. Beautiful. Great answer. And so appreciative. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, my friend, that concludes another great episode. And I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for going on this journey with me, going down this path as you and I continue to explore and uncover the truth of what it takes to completely transform. And now you've got two assignments. And the first one is it's really important that you take action on one thing that you heard from today's message. It's important to take the education with a little bit of implementation so that you can yield the results to go from good to great, to go from ordinary to extraordinary, to go from your everyday norm to a place where you can completely transform. And the second thing that I need you to do is share this message because there's a friend, a coworker, a loved one out there that needs to hear a piece of this. And it's what they are waiting for to help them radically shift the way that they've been living life and start to explore their true potential for them to get unstuck. And so I need you to screenshot this, tag me on social media or share or write a review or whatever it is you know is going to get this message out to the right person at the right time so that they can live the best life possible. Because that's our goal. That is our goal. You and me to be able to share the best messages that we possibly can and impact a great number of lives. So as always, I appreciate you. Coach Joseph Hawthorne, Truth of Transformation. Peace be the journey.